So what we're going to do is, we're, this is going to be a case study for domain decomposed MPI code. Um, the, the MPI codes you've written so far have had two features. One, if they've not operated on any data, you know, you've just been writing little test programs and such like. And secondly, they've all gone slower as you run them on more processes, which isn't very, very exciting. But you need to build up, you know, you need to understand how to program MPI. Now we're going to do a cal real calculation, and that will illustrate how you deal with real data in an MPI program, how you split it up and, and, and pass it around. But also, you'll get a code which hopefully goes faster as you run on more. Well, I guess the Pi example went faster as you run on more processes, sorry. But here's one which has a real amount of data. So we're going to start with a big array, which will, which will turn out to be an image. We're going to split it into pieces, and importantly, as I said, we're going to split it into, um, into strips. And this makes the code substantially easier than if we split it into, into blocks. And there are a number of reasons for that. First of all, the halo swapping is easier. You only have to swap halos up and down, okay? So that's, that's nice. You don't have to worry about left-right halos. Secondly, we'll come back to this, but if you split the, the, the domain up into the correct dimension, then the halos will be single blocks of data. So you can, do, you can send them with a single send or, and receive them with a single receive without having to worry about strided access with ve vectors and such like. So that's a significant, significant simplification. No matter whether you're C or Fortran, if you've got a block of data, one of the edges, either the, ver the horizontal or the vertical edge, is not a single contiguous block of data. So you have to play tricks with vectors and stuff like that, which is really a bit, that, that's just going to complicate things. So we, yeah, so we assign the pieces to processes, P0, P1, and P2. And we use halos to deal with these interactions. So as I said, uh, it will turn out that, 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 that each pixel depends on its four nearest neighbors. So it's, it is very similar to the cellular automaton traffic model, where each pixel depended on its nearest neighbors. But we're in two dimensions, so it's neighbors left, right, up, and down. And so, of course, if you own this, we're going to update. This has got lots of pixels in it. We're going to update each pixel based on the value of its four nearest neighbors. It's identical in in flavor to the to those of you here are here on Monday and Tuesday to the CFD example. It's effectively the same same example, but phrased as an image processing um, example rather than a fluid dynamics example. So it's okay in the in the body of the code of the body of your array. It's fine. You know all the data, but on the edges. You don't know what's happening with that pixel because it's been updated by this guy. And so what happens is you, rather than each time you need a pixel going and grabbing it from somebody, which would be very slow, you, you, before you do the calculation, you make sure you have all the data. So this is very typical in, in message passing calculations. The efficient way to do things is to say, what data am I going to need for the next long period of time, get it all and then do the calculation. Don't every now and again say, oh, but, oh I needed that, right, oh, I need that, oh, I need that data. Okay, that, that, that's not going to work. You need to say, right, for the next iteration or what's the longest period of time I can process it with, what data do I need? So I'm going to need all the data from this green processor along the top edge and all this data on the, from the blue processor on the, on the bottom edge. And we're going to do the same trick which I, um, which I mentioned in the cellular automaton uh, traffic model, which is to receive this data, we will have halos. We will declare our arrays to be one bigger than they need, actually, in both dimensions, so that we can fill in our boundary data. And halo swapping isn't as simple. Well, it is quite simple, but it's not trivial. You're not, you're, you're, you sort of have two, you have, your, you have your, your halo, but you also have your boundary. So your boundary, this red data, becomes the halo of this guy, and his boundary becomes your halo. You're not, you're not, actually swapping, you're, you're copying data. So you're effectively replicating the data. You're saying, I'm going to replicate this guy's data here, and he replicates your data there. Once you've done that, you can now update your whole array because you know all the values you need. And then you can just go through and do the update. Once you've done one update, of course, this guy has updated some of these pixels. So the next iteration, you need to swap the halos again. So when I was doing this example, I looked up some um, some um, literature on, on edge detection. And um, there's very, lots of algorithms for going. So this is a picture. This is, well, this isn't a picture of William Wallace. This is actually a picture of, uh, um, what is his name? Mel Gibson from Braveheart, who, as I always say, is very famous. Well, William Wallace is famous in Scotland because he killed lots of English people. And that's always a very, very good way of making yourself popular um, uh, in 12, was it 12, 19? I can't remember when the, so this isn't, this isn't Bannockburn, this is, this is 20 years before, whatever it was, 1295 or something, the Battle of Stirling Bridge. So what you can do is you can take this image and you can, 
There are lots of ways to compute the edges. And, uh, but the problem with that is it's a single pass operation. We take the image, we just loop through it all and we produce an output. And this is not worth parallelizing. If I read the image in, broadcast it all to all the processes, got them to detect the edges, brought it all back together again and wrote it out. You know, the, 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 calcul the, the IO, the, the, the communication time is going to dominate the calculation time. You might say, well, wait a second, you showed me this sharpen example on Monday, which did speed up. Well, I, I deliberately completely crippled the performance of that, of that code. I mean, you could make that code go a thousand times faster in three seconds. So, you know, that, that, that was, I mean, this is an illustrative example. But it turns out that for certain image detection algorithms, and particularly the very simple ones, it's possible to reconstruct the image from the edges. So I'm actually going to give you the edges, and you're going to have to reconstruct the image. It's a slightly fake thing to do. You wouldn't really do it in reality. But the important point is it takes hundreds of iterations, and therefore it's something that's worth parallelizing. Okay? So I'm going to give you the right-hand side, and you're going to have to recreate the left-hand side. So the edge detection image we use is very simple. We compare a pixel to its four nearest neighbors. So the pixels are between 0 and 255, black to white. And we just say the edge is the image, the pixel to the left and the right, up, down, up, minus four times the local um, value. And you might think, well, why would you do that? Well, it's quite obvious, actually, because you're just saying the edge is the difference between a pixel and it's the average of its four neighbors. So if a pixel has the same value as its four neighbors, then you get 4 minus 4, you get 0, okay? But if a pixel has a large difference from its four neighbors, then you get a, a, either a positive or a negative, but you get, you get a finite value. So you're just saying, is this pixel, ij, different from its neighbors? And if it's very different from its neighbors, you call that an edge. And that actually does work quite well. This, that's what we did here. We just compared each pixel to its four neighbors, and we came up with that. And that actually, it's not, it's not too bad. So what we're going to do is going to pad, we pad the 2D, now you might say, wait a second, what happens on the edge? Uh, sorry, on the edge of the image. If I'm right on the, on the boundary, what, what, what's, what's, what's image i, j plus 1 going up the way? Well, just for, um, just random choice, we'll say that anything off the edge is, 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 is white. So I want to imagine that the, the boundary around the image is white. So the serial code, we pad, we have halo values but we pad that they're constant. So in the serial code, what we would do is we put a halo around this image, but we'd set it to back up to constant values of 255 because our boundary conditions are images off the pixels off the edge of the image are white. Okay. So the image reconst it turns out that actually what I've said is the edge is grad squared image. I'm taking the second, I'm just saying the edges of the second derivative of the image. So if the image is, ch is not changing or changing linearly, I don't call that an edge, but if it's, if it's, if it's accelerating up or going down, then, then that's fine. So this is just a very simple, this is just a very simple standard discretization for the second derivative in two dimensions. So I'm just saying edge is, is, is the second derivative of the image. So, so if you don't, if you don't have a maths background, it doesn't matter. I mean, this doesn't have any impact on what you actually do, but this explains why you can undo it. So we want to solve grad squared image equals edge given edge. And it turns out that's a well-posed problem. So how do we do it? Well, it turns out that all you do is you say, you start off with the edges, which I've given you. You start off with an old image, which you can guess anything you want. Let's, you could just take your initial guess as zero. And many, many times you say the new pixel is a quarter of the old pixels, left, right, down, up, minus the edge. And then you just keep going round and round and round and round. It's a very, very simple algorithm, but it turns out that it does actually get you back the right answer. Um, so you can convince yourself quite easily that if you get to the answer, then it will stop. Because for it, right, if you get to the answer, then, then image uh, left, right up down is equal to the edge plus four times the image. So if we get that, this is equal to the edge plus four times the image. Well, that cancels, and we, so we, that means that the, the new thing is the image. You, you, can, you, you can convince yourself that if you reach the solution, you will stay there. It's quite easy to convince yourself that's true. It's not obviously that you will get to the solution, 
but it turns out that you do. But all we do is we just do this many, many times. The new value is some function of the old values minus the edge. So in parallel, we must update the Halo values from the neighbors every iteration, because of course, although I might read the pixels along the, um, the next processor's boundary, that processor is updating them. So the next iteration, I need to read them again. And it may not be obvious, but it turns out that in parallel, this is a very, very simple problem, so this is unusual, but the parallel code with this very simple algorithm should give bitwise identical results to the serial code. It should be exactly the same. There should be zero difference between your two codes, which is not normally the case in parallel codes, but here it's so simple that, that you should get that. So how are we going to decompose the array? So as I said, this is not a matrix, it's an image. Now, unfortunately, <laughs> people who do image processing, there are four ways of indexing. You could go left, right, up, down, down, right, right, you can understand, okay. So matrices go along, no, sorry, matrices go down and along. Uh, I like coordinates, I like to go along and up. Uh, image people think of scan lines, so they go along and down, okay. What's the one that's not used? Uh, up and a, no. Up and along, you wouldn't use, would you? You'd never go, you'd never go up and along. But image people, so I, I just said, well, I'm, yeah, I'll just, I think of these as coordinates, right? This is a coordinate system, i, j. So when I draw the pictures, if the picture is of size m by n, I will say i is going along the way and j is going up the way. So in, in, if, that, if, you, if you take that picture in, in C, then um, the way I've drawn it here, arrays are, are, are linear in memory, uh, in the second dimension. So, so if I split the array up into slices horizontal, uh, vertically, then the halos are solid blocks of memory, okay? So I can send and receive them with a single message. Similarly, in Fortran, it's the other way around. Fortran um, arrays are consecutive in memory in the first dimension, so I need to split the Fortran array uh, horizontally. So in C, my local arrays if I chose four processors, would be of size n, sorry, m over four by n, and in Fortran they would be of size m n over four, okay? But, so, so you could split it the other way, you could do this in C, but that would mean that your halos would now be non-contiguous in memory and you'd have to use vectors and it gets a bit complicated, so. So what I've provided you with more detailed instructions, and they are printed now, that's what, um, that's what came came here. I'll just leave them on the front desk for the moment, so because it is online, but you can get a copy there. A tarball of C or Fortran. I don't give you much, but I give you input and output routines, so you don't have to bother about how to do the I/O. And I give you a couple of input files. Um, well, I actually give you three or four input files to, to reconstruct. So my um, advice is. So write a serial code first with halos for fixed boundary conditions. Again, just like the Pi example, write the serial code first, okay? It's not trivial, but it's not particularly hard. But write the serial code first, and there you will have fixed boundary conditions. Your boundaries will just be all white. Then you distribute the work onto the processors, but you do set. So what I'm saying now is distribute the work onto the processors, but just get the processors to do independent reconstructions without communication. So just, and what you'll find is that you can, each, each process will reconstruct its own image, but it won't communicate with its neighbors. And what you will see is, you will see that the image looks okay, except you get, you get black, big black lines across it because you haven't communicated the halos. But at least that proves that you're doing the I.O. correctly, you're distributing the data correctly, you're reading it back correctly, and you're doing a sensible local calculation. Once you've done that, you can then complete the code by get the halos exchanged. Then you're doing a single reconstruction, you're reconstructing the whole image, and you should get an, an, an answer which is identical to your serial code. So there's further suggestions on the instruction sheet. I'll just have, bring up this sheet. Um, oops. So where is it? It is here. Um, case study exercise sheet. So, is that about as big as I can get it? Yeah, fine. So this is the method I've just written out here. Uh, this is the example. This is quite interesting actually. Are you, can you see on your screen? that there's a, you can, can you see there's a background like lattice on there? So I thought that was a mistake, but what, what's actually happened is, 
I stole this, sorry, I stole, I borrowed this picture off the web, and it was a JPEG, okay? Now, JPEG is, is, a, is a spectral compression method. It just takes, effectively takes a Fourier transform and throws away the high frequency modes. And it works on blocks. So J, the JPEG compression algorithm compresses blocks individually. And, and it's not obvious, but when you take the edges, you can see the artifacts. You can see that it gets it wrong at the edges because it's throwing away the high frequency mode. So it's quite interesting, actually. You can actually see the JPEG compression artifacts, which you can't see in the original image. But if you, if you, if you look at the edges, see how it changes. You can actually see the, so I thought that was a, a bug in my, in my code, but it, someone explained to me that it's probably not. It's probably you're seeing the JPEG compression artifacts. Anyway, there you go. Um, viewing the edges, reconstructing the full image. So I, I've tried to write the code in pseudocode in a way which is identical for C and Fortran. So I recommend that in, for, in Fortran you have this nice feature, you can declare your array dimensions to start anywhere. So in Fortran, if you have an array of size m, here it's useful to declare that to go from naught to m plus 1, so that your, your inner data is 1 to m, and your halos are naught and m plus 1. Of course, in C, that's a natural thing to do. In, so that actually works, that, that works quite well. The only annoying thing for C programmers is, well, th this is inevitable when you have halos, that these loops, when I say loop over i equals 1 to m, I mean 1 to m. I don't mean i equals naught i less than m. I don't mean i equals 1 i less than m. I mean 1 to m, okay? C programmers always forget to include the upper limit. Um, so... So the, the way this pseudocode is written, there's almost no difference um, uh, between the C and the Fortran. The slight technicality is that on disk, what am I trying to say? My I.O. routines assume that your array is the same size as the file you're trying to read. Okay? It seems obvious. But, of course, we're trying to put this image into an array which has halos. Okay? So... What you have to do, and this actually turns out to be even more necessary in the parallel code, which so it's worth doing in the serial code, is have an array which doesn't have halos. You have to have a special array with no halos just to do the I.O. You just want to read the data in there. Then you copy it into the, into the center of your array. Okay? You could get around that if you were played around with pointers and things, but it turns out in the parallel code, um, when we're going to broadcast this array, Across, well, no, we're not going to broadcast it, but we're going to scatter this array. We're going to read it in on a master process and scatter it to everyone else. If the array had halos on it, it would all go wrong, right? So you just you want to have the, the raw data. Then you copy it into the core of your, your arrays, which have halos. So that's what this seemingly um, unnecessary copy stage is here. That buff is my temporary array, which doesn't have halos, and then you copy it into the core of it. Uh, initial parallelization, where you just decompose it, um, so I've written all the code just says has loop limits MP and NP, but it just turns out in C, MP is M over P and NP is N, and in Fortran, MP is M and NP is N over P. I, was, I didn't want to write separate pseudocode for both, for both cases, so I've tried to conflate them. Uh, test the parallel code, form parallel code, and then this is how you do the halo swapping. It's not, and as I said, the important point is the halo swapping is exactly the same communications pattern as you've done for the message around a ring. Everybody has to send data to their neighbor, but it's a double thing. You send data to your neighbor from the left and receive from the right, and then you have to send other data to the right and receive from the left. You kind of do a, a forward and a backwards. But it's the pattern, if you've got a code which manages to break the deadlock with IS send and such like, then you can just effectively copy that. Remember, you're not sending one element here, you're sending a whole block of elements, but, but the pattern is the same except that we have non-periodic boundary conditions. So, as I said, I've just picked boundary conditions sort of randomly. I've set them to be white, but... Yes, I'm sorry. I've picked fixed boundary conditions. I could have had periodic boundary conditions. I could have said the pixel up from here was this one down here, but that kind of doesn't make sense for an image. So I've just taken the natural thing and said the image has got fixed boundary conditions. That's so... But you still need to use non-blocking communications to, to fix the deadlock. And then there's a lot of other stuff. Uh, if you're keen, I mean, you can, you can compute a tolerance. You can say, well, I'm just going to tell you to run this, um, to run this 
algorithm for a thousand, ten thousand iterations, but clearly in reality you need to have some stopping criterion. The obvious one is just are the pixels changing? So you just look at how much, how much the new pixels are, di are different from the old pixels, and at some point they don't change much anymore, and um, and uh, and you stop. And this just this is just turns out to be the same as the residual vector. If you if you've done iterative algorithms, you can look at overlapping communication and calculation if you're really keen. Um, you can play around with derived data types, um, and you can look at the alternative decompositions. All these are way you know what, you'll, nobody will get to this today, but they're just there for to play around with. Um, okay. So you would be surprised, disappointed, maybe about how many parallel programs are remarkably similar to this in principle. So if, you're, if you speak to someone who does high end, well, I used, used to do theoretical particle physics computational. We did lattice QCD, and people will tell you they've got five-dimensional representations of the SU3 gauge fields, blah, 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 blah. No, they're doing up, down, left, right, minus four times the middle. Well, it's not four because they're in five dimensions, four, three space, one time, and one fake one. So it's up, down, left, right, minus 10 times the middle. But you know, you know, it really is. And the things aren't into just their three by three matrices. But I mean, really, you know, you would be surprised at how many, if you look at a, a direct numerical simulation CFD code, somewhere in it, they'll be up, down, left, right, forward, backwards, minus six times the middle. Just like, uh, sorry, just like this, okay? So, because it's it's the second derivative operator, which is basically, and so you know, you would be quite surprised at how many codes have have this as their sort of as their as their fundamental structure. That's why it's quite a nice example to do, and you get pictures out, which I think is always nice. 